All right. Welcome to another episode of uh, a series that we're going to call Sync B-Sides, though that might change. I've been saying that now for quite a while, and it, we're still not sure yet. So <laughs> I've got with me a very special guest. I've got Grace. So Grace Hello. actually is... Um, I'm sorry, I should say Grace Ong, because I realize I uh, refer to people by their first name only nowadays. So Grace Ong. So Grace Ong is a senior marketing manager at Lintramax, which is an agritech company based in KL or in Malaysia. And they've been doing really amazing stuff in the B2B agricultural space. Um, we got her here to actually talk a lot about um, B2B marketing, kind of like how do you um, expand and grow a company in, in an industry such as agriculture and in agritech. Because even though we added tech to agri, it's still quite a traditional industry in that sense because the major players are still the same. Now they're just using technology, but it's kind of the same. So Grace, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm really excited to actually um, have a good conversation with you. Thank you for having me. Oh, no worries. I think, uh, I think I've been, you were one of the first people I asked actually to be on, uh, to be on this new podcast because I, I thought we had such a good conversation when we met at the conference. Part of. So I'm going to say that, um, so you and I actually had a really great conversation about marketing and specifically B2B marketing, because I had a misconception about it and how it worked and how we're using uh, digital marketing uh, channels and, and strategies in order to attract an ag- people in the agriculture business. And you kind of corrected me on that. I thought that was great because I, I was like, I was going around saying the wrong thing the whole time. So it's kind of good to be corrected at least early enough so I didn't like embarrass myself in a bunch of, in front of a bunch of people. Um, yeah, so great. Um, I mean, let's just jump straight into the first question and then like, let's just see where this takes us, right? Yeah. Um, could you just share a couple of like misconceptions um, that you actually had about the agriculture industry before you joined? Because I know that you, you didn't start off in agriculture. You started off in a kind of more traditional uh, marketing and digital marketing roles. So maybe you could yeah. just let me know what are some of the misconceptions you had? Um, I think... I really thought everything had to be very big and bombastic because um, I did intern in IBM before and I think um, it, it informed a lot of how I thought jargons should be used when it comes to marketing technology to businesses. It's like we need to use um, extravagant words that people don't understand, like business intelligence or um, like, you know, like the higher you go and the least people understand from your sentences, the more likely you are to impress them. I think that was um my biggest misconception, uh, something that I had to unlearn as especially in um, communicating to agriculture players. No, that's fascinating. What you mentioned actually is really interesting because what I've noticed in, in, in with, with my clients specifically, the more jargon you use, the less likely they are to be interested because they feel like they don't understand what you're saying unless they are in, um, they are in government or they're in, um, for some odd reason, venture capital. For, they just love they just love jargon and rather confusing words that I know how to use them properly in context, but I'm actually really not sure what they mean half the time because it's in my industry, but no one uses it within the industry. Only people who use it are people who don't fully understand what they're saying, so they just try to sound smart. Um, that's why I always... I've always had conversations without jargon as much as possible. Or if I have to use jargon, what I do is I have I add explain, explainers to it because it's, there's nothing worse than having a conversation with someone who doesn't understand what you're saying. So yeah. either they hate you or they just go like, oh, sure, sure. But they have no intention of following up. So I yeah. try and avoid that as much as possible. Um, I think that's fantastic because I think especially – um, when it comes to written materials, sometimes we get so tempted. Like when you look at the oh, words yeah, on the page, sure. and it, it looks so simplistic. Like, you know, even like a Form 5 graduate could understand it. And you feel that temptation to like add, you know, that jargon. <laughs> and once you start, it, it just starts spreading all over the paper. And yeah, it just becomes a monstrosity i think like in a way um but yes it's a bit like a virus right because adding one you kind of have to add more because otherwise it just seems out of place uh it, it, i mean that sounds a bit drastic i think especially in today's uh in atmosphere and environment but it's a little bit of a virus if you ask me um, I, I think especially in um i especially in the written word i would agree with you yeah for sure um so um 
I mean, <laughs> I know we had, we had, it wasn't a disagreement. I think we just had a short conversation about the use of the word, my use of the word old school, old school industry. Uh, and I mean, like quite traditional industry, I guess you could say, um, if you want to be nicer. Um, but like, what are the challenges you kind of faced when you, you walked into like, you know, like here's an agritech company, but it's still like in agriculture. Like what were the challenges that you faced? Um, it's a good question. Um, I think after reading a, a news clipping today, um, one of the, you know, previous ministers, he did say like some of the agriculture players are at like industry 2.0, um, yeah. where else the world is already in industry 4.0. So, um, I think old school doesn't, uh, does have its place, uh, in some companies, but not all. So, um, I think one of the biggest things about agricultural technology is that, um, you have such a wide gap in between like the players that are going all out mm -hmm. uh, with drone technology, with, um, you know, the latest seedling with, um, yeah, automated like pesticide applications. So you have these companies that are um, massive and they are delving deep into uh, the latest technologies to get the biggest harvest. And then you have um, players that uh, honestly use buku lima 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 to like, um, if you know what it is, it's like the 555 book. It's a small book and a small notepad mm -hmm. that they will use to like record their daily activities. Got with, it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Paper. Yeah. You uh, lost me there for a second. Not going to lie. I was like, we talked about jargon, Grace. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, sorry. Yeah, it's yeah. a tiny book that Malaysians use. Um, yeah. During our school days, uh, like nice. the prefects would use it for like, uh, those basically like a ruled, like a ruled paper, right? Like the thing. It's, it's a small book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's I know. I, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. So, um, yeah, so basically they, they would use those books in their fields to record like, you know, um, how much harvest this person has collected. And from there, they will maybe key it into an Excel and um, the numbers could be wrong because everything is manual. So from so the gap is almost like maybe a 50 year gap between um, the company that's using the latest technologies and the company that is the most manual. So um, I would say old school does apply and it makes um, marketing to the two extremes um, mm -hmm. extremely different because uh, you, you get the players that have almost everything and how do you market to them? And then the players that are like, oh no, this has worked you know, for our company for a hundred years, like, you know, we have used this practice for a hundred years with no issues. So why do we need to um, change now? But um, yeah, I think that that's one of the, the big things. But uh, I think the fantastic thing is that there are younger people going into agriculture in general, and they are a godsend because um, <laughs> then they start to bring a bit more passion for technology into mm -hmm. their companies, whether they are like family of the owners or, um, yeah, or just new blood, uh, new cadets, new plantation managers. Um, they're amazing. Got it. And yeah, no. LinkedIn. <laughs> so I, I think, I think that's actually really relevant to mo like quite traditional industries in general, because yeah. their people are going through a transition, but I think there's a misconception that all industries transition in like two years. Like, you know, it happened with transport, you know, Grab came in and kind of like destroyed everything, food delivery, everything like that, right? But yeah. traditionally industries, major players, and education is a brilliant example of this as well. We are talking about ed tech, but the majority of schools and education institutes still use very traditional pen and paper for the most part in quite a few markets. Or if they use yeah. computer systems, it's like industry 1.0, you know, they're still using dot, um, dot matrix printers in some schools I've seen. Um, so it's, it's, it's very applicable across multiple industries. And I think that's, I mean, it's, to be fair, if you've never seen it going into, it must've been a massive culture shock because you're working with a very digital first, uh, kind of mindset. And then suddenly you go, you, like you said, you meet people who use notebooks to kind of take down all the things that you kind of need. And then you're telling them, Hey, she has a he has amazing new technology that you can get everything done in in a split second, and they're like, "Nope, I've got my notebook here." Yeah, and and I think what happens is, uh, it's terrifying for them uh, because it feels like such a you know for us to adopt technology is maybe like a hop. 
But for them, it's truly a leap of faith because it's like, how is this going to transform um, how I work on an hourly basis? Like, you know, rather than consulting my, you know, 555 tiny book, <laughs> now I need to use my smartphone and like key in all these data. Mm -hmm. and, um, and all the data is now like uploaded into a, you know, map where my boss can exactly see where I've been harvesting and where I haven't been harvesting. And that type of um, mindset shift uh, is, I think, why so many um, agriculture players struggle with it. Because it's to them, it's really from left to right, from east mm -hmm. to west. It's so jarring um, compared to, you know, if I was to ask you to, like, add another software to your list of arsenal for the tools that you work with um it's almost a no-brainer but for them is like i've never ever done this before and suddenly um you know i'm using facial recognition to take attendance um it's it's almost um out of this world i think because mm -hmm. uh, it's almost like going back in time 50 years and telling people hey this is you know technology nowadays and yeah hop on so it's, I, it's, I, I always say that it's like trying to explain to my mom and dad how to use Netflix on broadband internet when they would just keep on asking. Uh, they still think the internet is on dial-up. And even then, that was like way too complicated for them to understand. And again, it's just a generational thing, right? You're, you're looking yeah. at people who are, who, who, if you went back to their time, you'd be like, I don't know how this works. And they'd be like, yeah. oh, you just got to spend hours and hours figuring it out while here, we'd look at a smartphone and figure out how to use it within 10 seconds, you know, how to oh, I've started out do everything. And there they take ages, right? So it's, it's a generational thing to me. Um, but I mean, I can understand, I can understand the user resistance to change. That's always yeah. a huge thing, especially we're trying to introduce things that are new. And uh, I hate to use the word that has been kind of burned to death, but disruptive. It, it kind of ruins, um, it kind of hurts, I think, a lot of people who just, if they knew how to kind of adapt to it, they'd be fine. Yeah. But the adapting is very difficult. Yeah. Um, actually, but that brings us actually uh, quite neatly onto the next point I wanted to talk to you about is um, how do you actually develop leads for a company? Because you you technically handle digital marketing for an industry, like you mentioned, where there's a big portion that are still using notebooks and very traditional methods, right? How do you use digital marketing to actually develop, to get leads for your company? Um, fantastic question. Um, I think one of the main ways uh, that generates um, the most leads for us is um, definitely search engine optimization and, you know, search engine marketing. Um, it has to really center around, I think, these two areas um, because social media, I think, gets a bit noisy sometimes, although I think a lot of them are on LinkedIn, but it's... Um, harder to target them because uh, the companies can be listed under real estate. It could be listed under other industries. Um, not everyone wants to list themselves as a um, agriculture company because a lot of them actually do diverse businesses. So um, I think it's really true. Uh, yeah. Google that we obtain our leads and the inbound leads can be oftentimes very surprising because you of course could get, um, you know, plantation managers, you could get uh, financial controllers, but um, you could even get like uh, the head of HR. I think maybe they realize they're spending a lot of, yeah, expenses on manpower and mm -hmm. um, on hiring. So they look into alternatives. Um, I think I've learned that uh, the audience can be very diverse, um, but being on search and um, I think, yeah, you mentioned inbound marketing before, and I think inbound marketing is um, as well as paid, you know, paid ads. Yeah. I think both of them are just extremely crucial because uh, when they search you, um, the intent is there. And I think that really helps when it comes to agriculture players, because if they have the intent to look into technology, um, then they are not so adverse as if they haven't even reached that level of intent yet. Got it. Super low hanging fruit, right? People who are just looking for the solution. And I think, I think that's great because, um, I'm, I'm a, I'm a massive proponent of, um, kind of balancing your marketing in order to generate leads or in order to do whatever you want to do. Cause I think a lot of people 
at least at least in in my industry and people and a few people that I've spoken to kind of take hard stances, right? They're like, you must only do this, or you got to do this. It's everything has to be paid, or everything has to be PR and, and earned. You kind of got to do both, to be very honest. A lot of things complement each other, or a lot of things are great, but they're not the f- finished product. If you have resources, if you have time, if you have money, why not do both in order to grow faster, grow more sustainably, and kind of build a business? So yeah. um, I think that's really interesting because I gone to my head. I wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have known what the search volumes are for, you know, agriculture, agri tech solutions. Like in Malaysia, I wouldn't have known what the search volumes are. And if you're getting majority of your leads, because even I'm assuming that this is not, these are not small, um, like uh, in terms of the lifetime value, they're not small customers, right? They're people who have to, they, it's very large accounts yeah. that are probably coming to you guys. So yeah. even if the volume is low, I'm assuming that that doesn't really matter as long as it's quality volume. Yeah. Yeah. It's an investment for them, um, which means it also takes um, a bit of a longer customer journey as well. Mm-hmm. I think from interest to purchase, because um, when you're purchasing a platform, you need to get all your key opinion leaders uh, on board mm-hmm. before you can make that decision, because it will impact your HR, it will impact everybody from, you know, payroll mm-hmm. to uh, the field workers. And um, in Malaysia, many of them are actually foreign labor, as we know. So um, it really, I think, takes um, a lot for the company to make that shift um, together, almost like moving a big ship. Mm-hmm. So, um, but it's an investment and it is worthwhile. But um, I think it takes a lot of patience, a lot of nurturing the leads as well. Yeah, no, I, you, you touched on a really interesting point as well, because um, I, I think everyone, when we talk about inbound lead generation, it is, you're literally starting the conversation at that point, it, but be, depending on how how much they're, they're incentivized to do it, how much they're looking for the solution, and as well as uh, to what level, So because there you get leads that are like, oh, I thought this was interesting, I want to find out more, then you get leads that... I am, they're literally searching for your solution, not by name, but they're searching for your solution. So they're already halfway through the funnel. Um, yeah. It's very interesting because I think that many people don't seem to understand that. And when they think about SEO and SEM, they're really thinking about just high volume kind of like driving in traffic to your website. Yeah. When in all honesty, I'd rather have 10 people visit my website with intent than 100,000 people without intent, right? Yeah. And yeah. that, that's a, that's always been that's always been a challenge for me to kind of I, I'll 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 straight out say it, it's so difficult to sell that concept to um, a business owner that then looks at the value per lead versus yeah. versus looking at it oh cool you're generating a hundred thousand visits I'm like yeah but you know I'm not sure that's really working for you um, so it, it's always it's always been a challenge for me um, yeah so with that in mind right because I've got a good I've I've got a follow up to that one because. What what is your caption method then for for these leads? Are you is it purely on the website? You'll have some other thing that you're doing. Is it directly to through the sales pipeline? What are we looking at here? Um, so we have a lot of information on our website. Um, sorry, your question is in regards to where is our messaging? Yeah, at? so the, so the the inbound leads coming in. Yeah, so where's yeah. your capture? Like where where's, where do you capture these leads? Is it is it through your contact us form or? Email yeah. or is it like you have like a sales pipeline that is already set up, you know, it directly goes to a salesperson with a quotation and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so we actually, um, we definitely want to demo the product first uh, before we even go into like quotations because it is an investment because mm-hmm. uh, of the entire platform. And I think oftentimes people can have uh, um, missed expectations without the mm-hmm. demo. If you just like, you know, here's yeah. a quotation for you and here's, <laughs> yeah, I think it, it can get um, a bit uh, overwhelming uh, when they don't know what they're getting, but you give them a price tag to it anyway. So uh, we definitely uh, take our demos quite seriously um, and we definitely want to get like as many departments as possible to see the demo so that they can see how it works together cohesively, not just how my section works or how you know, the accounts section works, but at least um, how everyone is involved together. 
um, most of our capture is, yeah, we uh, went a bit, I think, um, excited. So I have a lot of forms on my website because I wanted um, to be sure that at any point, if they had interest, that there was a form there. So um, there's not only a contact us <laughs> form, but um, all my individual product pages ends with a contact us form beneath it. I mm -hmm. Yeah, I got a bit over enthusiastic. And I was thinking, you know, if they're agriculture players and they already are interested, they might not want to like click a bit further. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure I caught them anyway. So um so that is uh, what we did. And I think it helps as well because uh, then we, uh, you know, rather than just using UTM codes, we can see the exact pages that mm -hmm. uh, fill up the form at, not just at the, you know, contact us page. So I enjoy having, uh, I think, uh, yeah, little um, additional information about uh, my leads. And I think that helps. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, I, I think, and I think when it comes to B2B, the the website is so critical, actually. Oh, yeah, for sure. For it sure. is so critical because, um, you know, before I came in, uh, our website was um, completely different with, yeah, photos of like fields. And, and they really did get calls on like people that wanted to like, hi, I want to work in a plantation. I can collect fruits for you. And, <laughs> and I think it's, it's really so crucial uh, for, for B2B marketers to, I, I think, invest um, a lot in your website because mm -hmm. your Facebook, your Instagram is owned um, by those companies and the privilege um, or the rights or the permission can always be taken away from you. Yeah. But um, your website is, is your own. So no, for sure. Owning your own platform, I think is critical, right? And, and people, you'll be amazed at the size of companies that I worked with that don't have a website. I've always, and I, and I've, I've, it's blown my mind to the point where I, I've actually spoken to them seriously and said, I don't think we can work together because I don't know if you're lying to me or not. <laughs> like, are you a real company or not? Um, because there's no website. There's literally no website or any sort of digital footprint. I, all I know is they have a registered uh, company. Yeah. But they're, they're big. I mean, they're willing to pay us a decent budget sometimes, and I'm, yeah. I've always been surprised by that. Um, so, like, okay, so I, I'm cognizant of time, and, and I don't want to take too much of your time, but... I think you touched on a really important point there when you, a well, really interesting thing where you said that you uh, you literally felt that you went overboard with the capture points, you know, your contact us page and stuff. That's actually good practice in terms of, um, because lead generation in industries that are challenging, I'll just say challenging, your touch points have to be kind of uh, as aggressive as possible without being in your face. You shouldn't have like six contact us points in one page, but you yeah. should technically have what we call soft and hard, soft and hard CTAs. So hard CTAs are literally give us a call, send us an email, and and we'll get back to you. Soft CTAs are you know here's a here's a white paper we did, here's a blog, here's a demo, here's a video to a demo, right? So we always so we always encourage our clients to have multiple call to actions that don't make the uh, the user or the visitor feel like they're being bullied, and. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so like when you were saying that, oh, yeah, one you have like every page has one, I'm like, yeah, oh, that's child's play. You should have more, <laughs> you should, have, <laughs> should have like two, <laughs> two, and three. Uh, but like okay, soft and soft and hard CTAs, yeah. uh, that's usually what we suggest. Um, I mean, okay, so I've got one last question and then I'm, I'm gonna let you go, uh, Grace. But, um, so you mentioned that SEO and ACM are still your, your, your main platforms for growth in the company, but are you looking at any other platforms right now or any, any other channels? I think that is, um, a good question. I think we are thinking of, um, I mean, we have been building our LinkedIn page cause, um, as a B2B, um, industry at the end of the day, although we are towards, uh, agriculture, but we're still, uh, business to business. Um, I think LinkedIn is something that we have been um, posting in and yeah, just just trying to grow our following. Um, but I, I think our venture into LinkedIn is more of um, at a branding level than at a lead generation level because uh, marketing in LinkedIn is also not cheap. Um, based on the, the rates at the moment. So yeah. um, I, I think I would use LinkedIn um, for branding purposes for, um, I think, employee branding as well. Because mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, we are a software company. So we want to um, gain that traction. But um, I 
actually also would say that, um, yeah, although this is a turnaround to your point for um, in terms of the lead generation, uh, but I think buying um, the right keywords uh, sometimes isn't just about acquiring um, the leads, but we also managed to get uh, quite a few good um, talents through our SEO and SEM. So um, one of my colleagues now, she was actually wanting very much and very and she's very passionate about smart farming. So she specifically was searching smart farming companies mm -hmm. um, in order to find a job and she found us. So um, I was very pleasantly surprised by that leading to point four. Um, <laughs> but coming back to uh to yeah to the new to new platforms, I, I think it would be still um yeah, LinkedIn and, and Facebook. I definitely as much as I'm tempted to don't see us going on like TikTok yet. So um <laughs> You're missing out. You're missing out. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I, I'm not sure um, how many plantation, um, you know, managers are there. Or maybe I should check it out. So, but, probably um, a lot. They're just not going to be really looking for um, potential solutions on TikTok. <laughs> but yes, if a dance video could sell a software, I'll highly consider it. I wish it could. I, I'd be dancing on it right now. Um, <laughs> Grace. Uh, okay, so thank you so much. I think your your answers and insights were really interesting. I, very different from uh, like you know B two C marketers and even more traditional like enterprise B two B companies that are not that are not as again traditional as agriculture. I'll say that um, it's very good to get insight from different kind of walks of marketing. Um, what I'll do is I'll be I'll be tagging Lintramax and I'll I'll put information about the company as well and everything that we put out there, and then I'll be sharing um I'll I'll connect I'll connect everybody to you as well. Uh, if you have anything that you'd like to shout out about Lintramax about yourself, please do. Happy to include this in the video as well. Right. Um, okay. I yes, I wasn't ready with a sales pitch, so <laughs> I'll try my best. I'm like, okay, this was not like planned. Um, well, I I think for anyone who is um, you know, in technology, I would say, uh, especially if you are passionate about um software, I I would yeah, I would say it's a a great place to explore because I think um oftentimes even. At interviews, sometimes people get a bit taken aback when it's like, oh my goodness, it's not just technology, but it's agriculture technology. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're in for um, something new, something refreshing, I, I think it's a fantastic um, yeah, thing to explore in your career. But um, to anyone who is in agriculture or part of an agriculture company um, or part of a company that has an agriculture arm, um, I think, yeah, just check out Lintramax, check out what we do. And I think um, let's start the conversation. I think that's all I would say. Awesome. That was, that's very well put. I'll make sure to tag every, uh, tag everything relevant in the video and then I'll share it with everyone. So thank you very much, Grace. Appreciate you taking your time out of your busy day to talk to us. And yeah, um, looking forward to uh, having a coffee with you when I'm back in KL soon. Yes, that sounds amazing. Thanks for having me.